So I deliberately programmed an early stopping point into this because I wanted to kind of summarize where we're at uh, and then move to another set of topics, primarily about interference. But I wanted to make sure that there was a logical dividing point here and, and uh, especially since I was kind of concerned about running out of time. But uh, just to give you a summary so far, I mean, we've got sensitivity we've talked about. That was one of the things I was asked to address. And I suggested thinking about this in terms of intrinsic sensitivity, which is associated with the instrument, and then the sensitivity that you get from technique. And you really have to consider both. Um, not only as an astronomer, but I would say also as someone who plans on doing something like dynamic spectrum, uh, this number doesn't tell you the whole deal. This number also has to be considered and it is complicated because we have all these different observing modes. You now know that there's continuum sources, there's spectral line sources, there are pulsars, so we have this dispersion thing, and uh, they're all very different utilizations of the time frequency plane. Similarly for spatial and spatial dimension, we have single pixel stuff, which is essentially what the GBT does most of the time. We have aperture synthesis, which is what the VLA does most of the time. And we have VLBI, which is what the VLBA does most of the time. And then just to throw in yet another mode is uh, it's pretty common now to take all those dishes and phase them up as a phased array, no different from the phased array that people in this audience probably know and love. And then the answer to the question, what frequencies do you use? This question uh, I get asked uh, quite often. Uh, and the answer is all of them. I hope that's apparent now. There's, uh, there is useful scientific flux density at all frequencies, not just because of the red shifting of spectral lines. That's, that's the answer I usually hear uh, when we talk about observing outside of allocated bands. And that's certainly true, uh, but there's continuum sources and there's all these other things going on uh, that kind of drive you to want to use all the frequencies. So of course that brings us to uh, the interference question. And um, uh, everybody has a different take on this. Uh, I will give you the take that I have, uh, I would offer, again, based on my standing as an instrumentalist primarily and someone who intermittently does science. Somebody else would probably have a different take on this, but I think they're all, all the takes are essentially similar. They're just different views of the same or perspectives of the same assessment. And what I tend to do is I sort things out by strength at the receiver and then categorizing by impact. So here's categories of interference, as I would allude to refer to them. Uh, linearity limiting, obscuring, confusing, and harmless. Uh, harmless is probably self-explanatory. Linearity limiting means that the interference is so strong that it is changing the radiometric state of the instrument. Um, you know, strong enough to change gain or frequency response. And that's obviously gonna be a case where the uh, interference noise ratio is huge compared to the signal noise ratio. Uh, that's something you deal with by filtering primarily. I don't think anybody in this audience needs to be have that explanation. Um, you know, linearity limiting sources can be either inside or outside the pass band. Instruments are designed with great effort to avoid strong sources in band, but sometimes you just can't. Uh, and uh, as you see now, there's strong incentive to have big bandwidths. So sometimes strong sources end up in band, but ordinarily that's like the first order design in an instrument would be say, you know what, we're not gonna to touch the FM band or we're not gonna to touch uh, DTV channels or something like that, just to kind of put this problem uh, in a box as quickly as possible. And of course you can have linearity problems by anything that's too close to the main load. So you could have a linearity problem simply because something uh, satellite walked across the main lobe or a strong side lobe or a high side lobe, and that could temporarily, for example, drive the receiver into compression. That happens quite often and people, uh, astronomers sometimes realize it's happening and oftentimes don't. Uh, and they just realize something's gone wrong with the measurement. Um, obscuring means that everything's, liter everything's linear. There's no problem with the uh, instrument state uh, per se, uh, but it's strong enough so that you see it as interference. It's obvious, obscuring could be obvious. Uh, once again, that's pretty obvious if you see something that you know, looks like technology that has a big uh, 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 interference noise ratio compared to the interference signal noise ratio that you've got. Um, uh, flagging and blacklisting are two class, are kind of the go-to methods there. You hope that it's localizable in the time frequency plane, then you can blacklist it. I showed you one example of that. Uh, or you can flag it, which means you spend a lot of time looking in the time frequency plane and getting rid of pixels, time frequency pixels, where you think that was interference. Uh, 
it was a fairly grueling process. Um, the, um, and it's a fertile ground for the introduction of new single processing techniques. So in fact, me personally, I spend a lot of time thinking about this problem. Uh, making headway in this is very, very difficult for a whole bunch of reasons, which I'm not gonna have time to talk about. But if you're interested, I can certainly point you in direction of uh, discussions that start kind of where we're at and then go forward to talk about how hard it is to do these things. Third category is confusing interference. By confusing, I mean it's hard to tell whether it's interference or what you're looking for. And this accounts for a lot of headaches, and I'd say it's equally a problem. Of course, this means that the interference noise ratio has turned out to be, at the end of the observation, comparable to signal noise ratio. So you don't know whether you're looking at actual source or interference. There's no defense for this because you can't tell what happened. Um, that is, until you get to very sophisticated things. Maybe I'll be able to allude to those in a moment. Um, and then harmless, of course. Uh, but harmless uh, can be a temporary condition. I alluded to this issue of diffuse, in the time frequency sense, interference, eventually bubbling up to be uh, significant. So uh, it is not uncommon to do an uh, observation where you integrate for a long time, and then all of a sudden you're interference limited because the interference finally became significant compared to the uh, noise that you're trying to beat down. Here's a fun example of linearity limiting noise. Um, this is actually from an experiment I, I, was, uh, I was working on not too long ago at Green Bank, not on the GBT, but on the 20 meter Green Bank, which we we're using at the time to do fast radio burst stuff. Um, this is power and arbitrary units, uh, just linear power versus time. So we're looking at uh, inside a se one second of observation at a very high time resolution. This is not an output we normally get, but we're finishing the system. And uh, lo and behold, uh, look at this. Uh, this is clearly not uh, anything uh, astrophysical. In fact, it's not anything coming um, directly from uh, uh, the instrument. It's in fact a symptom of the instrument screaming. Uh, what's happening here is, in fact, here, there's a radar beam sweeping past the instrument, and radar is a pulse radar, and every time there's a pulse firing, it is strong enough to drive the receiver into compression. So every one of these down spikes is a pulse happening outside of the observing band, but causing the entire gain of the receiver to sink momentarily. So these are not the direct reception of the pulses, but rather the drop in the gain because the receiver is driven in compression by something out there. So that happens actually more often, I think, than, than a lot of us probably realize. In fact, this is a radar. This is something else happening entirely. That can't be the radar. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's significant. Uh, oftentimes it's not seen at all because it's a transient thing. This is just a few hundred milliseconds every 10 seconds or so. But I'm just trying to illustrate here a linearity limiting condition where the interference was not something in band. It was just the the receiver being uh, being clobbered by something out of band. More interesting, and I think somewhat more uh, uh, difficult and, uh, to deal with, is the obscuring versus confusing cases. So I'll show you two cases just that I happen to know about uh, that I can explain in detail. Uh, one is observing hydroxyl at uh, this telescope, which is an interferometer in Australia, actually, uh, where this is the actual hydroxyl line. And um, uh, we're observing it in the proximity of a glow nass. And by that, that, I mean, glow nass just happened to be going through uh, a lower side lobe at the time. We know it's glow nass because we can, again, this is where the signal process came in. You can, you can observe, you can essentially implement a glow nass receiver, solve for the waveform, subtract the waveform, and then do the calculation again. And when you do that, you get this. <laughs> And the difference was this uh, GLONASS uh, waveform. By the way, that's the main lobe way up there. And then we're looking at high order side lobes, spectral side lobes of the GLONASS emission. So what you see here is a case where, you know, it's pretty obvious that this chunk of spectrum has been wiped out in this observation because the signal noise ratio is enormous compared to the uh, 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 system temperature. But over here where we're interested, um, the flux is being jerked around by a small amount and it's not obvious until you do this whole analysis that the error in the flux that you're calculating here is due to these very high order side lobes in an emission that was far away uh, spectrally. So this is a case where, you know, it, you might not have realized that a satellite walked through a high order, uh, lower side lobe 
um, and messed up the flux uh, or caused the flux to jitter, you might just realize that something didn't happen right. Or worse, you might not realize that and erroneously report the flux of this particular source. Uh, that's frequency domain. Same thing happens in the time domain. So this is uh, something I was happy to work on at Arecibo at the time. And Arecibo, they have a problem with L-band radar. It, it, well, actually, they have this problem at Green Bank as well, but Arecibo is particularly bad. Uh, this is L-band radar for aviation. So this is an airport radar. And uh, this is actually an impulse response. So all wireless engineers know about power delay profiles. That's what this is. It's an impulse response. It's no one waveform. It's just looking at the delay profile uh, the uh, channel impulse response, if you will, uh, as a power delay profile, and just looking at it over and over again as this, these pulses combine, just lining them all up. So what you see for this power delay profile for this particular radar is there's a big peak where you're directly lit up, and then there's all these subsequent peaks, which are reflections of the pulses from terrain. So these are all terrain reflections, and then these are aircraft reflections, not surprising since the radar is presumably tracking aircraft, but this goes up, whereas the primary mission where you're being illuminated um, is only a few milliseconds long, this goes on for hundreds of milliseconds, excuse me, hundreds of microseconds. The pulse is, hundreds of, is a few microseconds wide and the delay spread is hundreds of microseconds. So here's a case where the time domain, this is obscuring interference. You would certainly know for something that had that same time frequency occupancy that something had gone wrong. But if you're working at larger, at different time frequency occupancies where you are sensitive to this, you might not realize something was wrong. And this, is a, this would pile up and eventually bias a flux density estimate. Uh, here's another pulsar example. Again, pulsar problems you tend to look at in the frequency domain. That's the vertical axis here from one to two gigahertz. Uh, and then uh, as a fold, folded version of the periodic emission. So, when you say pulse phase here, this is one period of the pulsar. Uh, so before you do anything with it, you see this dispersed pulse. Remember, high frequencies arrive first, low frequencies arrive last. You do do the dispersion, that's tilting the uh, time frequency plane so that all the emission lines up. It's an inverse chirp transform. And, and you see this. Uh, and you recognize right away, or at least most experienced astronomers would realize right away that there's something miss here. That's because of a whole bunch of junk going on here between one and three gigahertz. Um, and if it's uh, when it's not there, and this is, there's no interference mitigation going on here, it's just another time when it was not there. Not only do you see another copy of the pulse down here, uh, but that's what the baseline looks like. So this is an example of obscuring, um, uh, excuse me, um, of um, uh, confusing uh, interference. Because again, this is an intermittent thing. You might not know to look for it. Uh, and you might not realize that this is not pulsar structure. Uh, you probably would suspect something was wrong. But there's all kinds of ways that it could happen where it produces spurious emission, and then you'd be confused. It gets worse. Um, here's an example of what I call pulsar spoofing. Uh, here again, this is from the fast radio burst experiment that we did a few years ago at Green Bank. We use the crab pulsar, which is a well-known pulsar. Um, it produces a, intermittently, it produces giant pulses, which are anomalous and not periodic. So they make good test subjects for fast radio pulses if you're trying to design an experiment to find those. So here we're commissioning on the crab pulsar. Uh, here's, again, time and frequency. Um, this has been de-dispersed now, so it's vertical, not because there's no dispersion, but because we've already removed the dispersion. Um, this is what it looks like in the time domain is a sh sharp pulse. And then the bottom is a method that we use to identify these things as a matched filter. It's a matched filter for dispersion. Uh, DM is just dispersion measure. It's a way of measuring the dispersion. For this particular object, we know it should be about 57 uh, uh, on this uh, scale. Uh, so giant pulses are 57, should produce a bright spot there. So sure enough, this is, a, this is a, the crab pulsar. For somewhere else, we would suspect it was another pulsar. And then we look some later time, what happens is uh, there's this radar that showed up. All of a sudden in the G dispersed uh, time frequency plane, the return on the chirp from this uh, linear uh, FMCW radar just happens to have a DM of 57 or very close to it. So it looks to us very much like the crab pulsar. So that's very frustrating. 
And this is a case where we know a DM that we're looking for. If we didn't know we're looking for a particular dispersion measure, we would not know the difference between this and an astrophysical source. Uh, at least we'd be suspicious once we saw it period, being periodic. But um, this, this consumes a lot of time and effort sorting out this kind of thing. And uh, I'd also point out here uh, that particular pulsar, that particular uh, radar is, has invaded the uh, passive band, which ends at 1427. It's actually showing up at 1425. And so I'm not sure who's doing that or why, but it shows up from time to time. Probably reflected, that uh, would be my guess. There's somebody out there doing it and it shows up as a reflection from an aircraft, but I digress. In terms of VLA, uh, interferometry and imaging, it turns out there's a huge advantage uh, that you get in interferometry, which is subtle and but very powerful. And that's that this process of doing interferometry tends to decorrelate interference, which is outside of the delay beam. That is, um, anything that's not corresponding to the delays that we're building into the interferometer to point at a particular point in the sky tend to uh, be decorrelated because they have bandwidth. And you know, delay and bandwidth, uh, the phase shifts you get as a function of delay, the, the slope, the phase slope changes um, depending on delay. So the larger the bandwidth, uh, the more suppression of interference you get. It's a rather remarkable and useful property. What it tends to do is it converts, the way I think about this, it tends to confuse, convert a lot of interference that would be confusing into harmless. So uh, it saves a lot of effort. Um, on the other hand, it really has no effect on obscuring interference because typically this effect is not enough to push something which is obscuring into the confusing range or, or harmless range. Typically it just makes it into other confusing uh, stuff. <clears throat> the, um, uh, Here's a great example of that. So this is a slide I stole from Greg, uh, Greg Taylor, uh, showing um, this is, uh, these are three baselines measured at the VLA. So each baseline remembers a correlation and each one of those correlations has a, is a dynamic spectrum. Here's frequency and here's time, All right? So uh, what you see on a baseline, which is 35 kilometers long, one of the longest baselines is beautiful. It just looks nice and noise-like, which is what you want to see. If you go to three kilometers at the same time, a very short baseline in the same array, it looks like hell. It, it's got all this interference and stuff in it. They both saw the same environment, but here, this is a short baseline, this is a long baseline, and that decorrelation due to baseline length is really powerful. Doesn't let you off the hook though, because as Greg points out here, it makes a big difference. And it's almost, it's pretty important to, you need these short baselines, you can't just throw them away. So you clean them up. So uh, uh, there is uh, several pack packages of software that let you do these kinds of things. They have different trade-offs. Um, it's all the trade-offs that you'd associate with any kind of interference mitigation. You can be ultra aggressive and take the chance of ruining the data, or you could be not aggressive enough and take the chance of being subject to the interference that's left behind. So uh, it turns out here, in this case, and oftentimes you can find that trade-off, but that trade-off often takes a long time to sort out. That brings us to harmful thresholds. Um, so this is an idea that most uh, spectrum related people know about. You now know enough to say, you know, know something about the fact that, you know, you can probably assess based on the sensitivity of the telescope and its side lobes, you can come up with the numbers, at least on some statistical basis, uh, establish what level of spectral flux density, right? Jansky's, how many Jansky's here, it's dB watts per square meter per Hertz. Uh, would cause a problem in the sense that it would start to show up uh, at the level of sensitivity of something in the main beam. And typically the way these things look is uh, like this. Uh, here's frequency from uh, one gigahertz to uh, 100 gigahertz or more. TP is total power. That is any dish which is not an interferometer. Uh, so those are most vulnerable because you don't get this decorrelation effect. For anything which is an interferometer like the VLA or the VLBI, you get a big improvement because of this decorrelation on baselines. In fact, the longer the baselines are, the better. Um, and uh, the, uh, they all go up because in frequency, because when you go uh, up in frequency, the side lobes all kind of collapse around the main lobe. The main lobe becomes narrower. Uh, the the over aggregate vulnerability in the high order side lobes becomes less. So this is a plot that goes around a lot. It's, uh, it's often used. It, I should emphasize this is somewhat simplistic, but necessarily so. So it's uh, uh, sometimes said to be simultaneously essential and useless. 
that's essential and that you need some way to bound problems like this. It's kind of useless because for every example you can think of where this works as an effective bound, you can probably think of three other examples where it's not going to work out so well. It's not going to be quite reflective of the actual situation. And to give you a sense of scale here, um, everybody likes to see this kind of number. Think of 100 millo or 0.1 milliwatts, 10 megahertz bandwidth, 1,000 kilometers away, isotropically radiated. Uh, that's 80 Janskys, right? It doesn't depend on frequency. We're just computing flux density from a isotropic uh, radiated source. That's 80 Jansky, so already you're right here. So here's you know, 100, you know, 0.1 milliwatts, 100, uh, 1,000 kilometers away, you're already here. Uh, if you increase that to 100 watts, which is now leaping frogging to the other end of what you might imagine coming from a base station, for example, uh, that's 80 megajanskis, and that's way up here. So you can kind of see what you're up against. Again, I think this is useful for kind of initial feelings about things, but I would warn you about relying on this as a, uh, a way to, uh, you know, authorize, for example, the use of a system. This is just, I, I, this primary use is to try to understand what the vulnerability is. I should emphasize that uh, observations really do happen at these levels. Um, uh, again, I don't want to go through the table, but this is a list of the detrimental limits from the previous slide. These are observations uh, expressed in turn, the same units, but for things that people have done. And I'll tell you, this one here is, uh, I think, just tens of microjanskis. So uh, you can kind of see that people are really observing at levels which are kind of, kind of uh, impressive relative to these detrimental limits. Ah, so I will appease Chris by now ending up the final slide. So um, uh, just to show you, this is, this is a slide that's going around a lot because we all love it, but it's the, the sky if you could see, if your eyes saw radio intensity and, and not uh, optical, this is what you'd see. Every point here is not in fact a star, it's a galaxy. And these uh, distributed objects are combinations of hydrogen clouds and supernova remnants. In fact, I think that's a supernova remnant right there. So um, uh, just a little bit of eye candy there. Here endeth the tutorial.